So when you guys hear the word power, what comes to mind? Okay, I heard electricity, what else? Nothing else, only electricity? Daniel, strength. That goes hand in hand with Daniel. Okay, so it's definitely not having to do with electricity here. We don't cover electricity in this class. We don't discuss it. Okay, but it does have to do with something we've already been talking about, which is work. Okay, power is the rate at which we get work done. That's basically what power means. Okay, and do you guys remember that work? What is work when we think about work? It's a transfer of what? It's a transfer of energy. Remember how we drew the picture and we were going from like the environment to the system and it was work in and work out, okay? So the first definition we're gonna see of power is that power is equal to the derivative of the energy of the system in reference to time, okay? Does anybody know what the unit for power is? Joules. It's watts. Yeah, whoever said watts. Good job. Okay, well, that's a funky W. It's watts, all right? Watts. Watts, watts, watts. Okay, so we are going to currently want to just focus on work as a source of energy transfer, okay? So when we think of it in terms of energy transfer and we think of it in terms of work and we say that power is the rate at which work is done, this can actually get represented as that power is the derivative of work with respect to time. You end up not actually having to do any calculus, you guys, so don't worry. Okay, so this is the first definition we're sort of looking at in relation to work. And this shows that power is the rate of work. That's what this definition right here gives us, that power is the rate of work. So let's say we have a particle and it's moving through some small distance, right? Because whenever we use the lowercase d instead of our big delta, doesn't it usually mean that we're doing a small distance? Yeah, okay. So we're moving a small displacement, dr, and we're getting pushed by some force. And we want to figure out basically, well, how fast do we get do that? So you guys remember from when we talked about work, we said that a small change in work would be equal to f dot dr, right? You guys remember that? Okay. So all that happens when we bring work to power is that power takes work and has the dt there. Because we have some sort of change in work that's happening. So it's like, how much does the work change over this change in time? It's like a delta. Yeah, it's like a delta, but the lowercase d means that it's like a small change. You guys, do you remember what this represents? Okay, it's the derivative of position, right? What's the derivative of position? Velocity. Velocity, awesome. So that means that this can be written as F dot V. So the first equation that we are deriving for power is that power is equal to F dot V, which means it's equal to F V cosine of theta.
Okay. Yeah, we just did all of this to get to that. But we got there. Now we did it. So let's look at an example with it. Okay. I'll leave I'll leave the equation up there. So does there always have to be a theta when we're doing power? Well, think about it. If there's no angle, if it's on a flat surface, what happens to this? It becomes one. It becomes one, which means that if there's not a theta, if we're doing it on a flat surface, it's really just force times velocity. Okay. The cosine theta is there because this is a dot product. And remember that when we talked about dot products, this is how we represent dot products. Okay, so let's talk about the power output of a motor. When you hear that a motor has a lot of power, what do you usually associate that with? Strength, watts, push. Strength, watts, push. Is it going to be, is a powerful motor going to be more like a sports car or more like my compact Prius? It's going to be like the sports car if it's got a lot of power, okay? I mean, I appreciate you saying that my Prius has a lot of power. I think it has a, a decent bit, but... Huh? I love my Prius. Okay, that's, that's too many kids in a Prius. Okay, so we're going to do a problem with this, okay? We've got a factory, and it uses a motor and a cable to drag a 300-kilogram machine to the proper place on the factory floor, Okay. So we're pulling a 300 kilogram machine. So let's say I'm gonna represent our machine that we're pulling as a box because I don't wanna draw a machine. And it's 300 kilograms and we are somehow managing to pull it to the proper place on the floor. So let's say, so it's dragging it. So let's say it's dragging it across the floor, okay? dragging it across the floor and we want to know what power most must the power oh my gosh what power must the motor supply to drag the machine at a speed of 0 0.5 meters per second for oh it doesn't say for how long but we do have a coefficient of kinetic friction so there's going to be kinetic friction present and our coefficient of kinetic friction is going to be equal to 0 0.60. That's a big uh, friction constant. It is a big friction constant. But I mean, this is a really big machine that we're trying to drag. So there's a lot of friction going on there. Okay. So what is this? Okay, what kind of force is it? Tension. Good, it's a tension force. And then this is the force of? Friction. What kind of friction? Kinetic friction. Kinetic friction, okay. So this is basically our free body diagram, so that's nice. Now, is there any angle here that we're having to deal with? No. No, okay. So that means that we're going to say power is equal to force times velocity, okay? And here we know that it's a tension force. Do we know what the tension force is? We can solve for it. We can solve for it. Okay. So is V changing or is it constant here? Constant. It's constant. Okay. So that's going to help us a lot. Because that means that since it's constant, if we sum our forces in the x direction, we're going to be able to find what the tension is pretty easily. Okay. Now, what are our forces in the x direction? Yeah, so we've got tension, and then we've got friction. Remember, it's in the negative direction, okay? And since this is moving at a constant velocity, what is the summation of these forces equal to? Zero. Zero. Why are they equal to zero? Yeah, because it's not accelerating. If it's not accelerating, that means when we do mass times acceleration, we get zero. So this whole thing's going to be equal to zero, which means that our tension force is equal to our frictional force. You guys see that? How I took this, moved it over, rearranged, and we get this. If you're doing it up front, you'd be able to get 
Uh, yeah. Okay. You have to write everything to get points on FRQs. Okay. So now we can think about, we know that the tension force is equal to the friction force. What is the friction force equal to? Fun. Yeah, friction's fun. So we're going to have mu, we're going to have that coefficient of kinetic friction times our normal force. We have everything that we need for that, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So our mu is 0 0.6. And then how do we find our normal force? Gravity times mass. Mass times the acceleration due to gravity, but in the positive direction, which is 9.8 meters per second squared. You said 1764? Yeah. Do you guys agree with that? Yeah, that's what I mean. What are the units? Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, it's just 1764? Yeah, that's our tension force. So in order to solve for our power, we're going to take that 1764 newtons, and we're going to multiply it by our velocity of 0. 5 meters per second. Perfect. How do you do watts? Like, what's the unit symbol? That's just W. It's a capital W. Not too shabby, right? Not too bad? No? We're also going to have to be able to calculate power on like an angle, like yeah. the problems in the last. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Okay. So, are you guys ready to look at another example? Okay. So, we're going to talk about the power output of a car engine. Right? Yeah, vroom, vroom. Yeah, got a car. Okay. So, we have a car and it's 1,500 kilograms. Okay. What kind of car do you want it to be? Okay, it's a Toyota Camry. Okay, so we got a Toyota Camry, and the mass of the Toyota. <laughs> is, it, is it your car? Possibly. It's fifteen hundred kilograms. Okay, its front profile. So I'll draw a picture like this is the uh, front profile of the Camry. Sorry, that doesn't really look like a front profile of a Camry. It's the best I can do. <laughs> okay, the front profile of the Camry is 1.6 meters wide and 1.4 meters high. We've got a coefficient of rolling friction of 0 0.02. So that's going to be between the wheels and the what? The ground. The ground. And we want to know what power must the engine provide to drive at a steady 30 meters per second if 25% of the power is lost reaching the drive wheels. Is that too This is loaded, right? Okay. So this is all the information we're given. Our 2007 Toyota Camry has a mass of 1,500 kilograms. The front profile is 1.6 meters wide, 1.4 meters high. We've got a coefficient of rolling friction of 0 0.2. We want to go at a steady 30 meters per second, but 25% of our power is lost reaching the drive wheels. Huh? We're going to be dealing with drag. Yeah, we're going to be dealing with drag and friction, okay? So, if we're driving at a steady 30 meters per second, what can we go ahead and say we know that our net force is? Zero. Yeah. Our net force is going to equal zero, okay? Now, what's opposing our motion here? We have drag and we have rolling. Yeah, we've got rolling friction and drag. And what way is the car going, forward or backwards? Forward. Okay, it's going forwards. So, the force of the car 
is basically going to be our net force. And it's going to be determined by those two forces, the force of the drag and the rolling friction. Okay. So what's going on here is that we have these two opposing forces. So we've got that the force of the car is going to be equal to some form of rolling friction in drag. So these are sort of what they're going to have to overcome, okay? And now we're going to bring up an old, old, old equation that you guys have not seen in a very long time, okay? But first, how are we going to represent friction? You can do mu r in, right? Okay, now drag is the one you guys haven't seen in a long time. So I'm just going to throw it up here. You haven't seen this since we talked about drag. So it's been a minute. And that's one half C rho A B squared. This is an old equation. You guys haven't seen this in months. I don't think you've ever seen it. Never seen it? No. Yeah. I think we might have been on a problem set. No, definitely not. Okay, well, that's our equation for drag. Okay, but thankfully, this stuff is pretty easy to find. The A, for instance, what do you think the A stands for? Acceleration. It's capital. Oh. Altitude. Area. Area. Okay. Rho is going to be a constant for the density of air. So is the area referring to the surface area or the space? It's referring to the area we're going to get from the front of the car. Okay. So let's find those. See, I'm struggling because I left that out of my notes for some reason that I don't know. It's another constant, though. Yeah, Google it, you guys. Tell me what it stands for. It stands for cool. Stands for cool. What's the drag coefficient? So it's, it's called open stack stuff. But it, it has a list of a bunch of objects and they're dragging. And they're drag coefficient. And so it's weird. The camera is 0.28. Point two. Point 0.28. You guys just want to put them 0.28. Yeah. What did you do? Don't worry about it. Wait, can we just solve for it? How are you going to solve for it? You don't know the force of the car. Don't we know? Oh, yeah, yeah. Is it 0. 0.000? Or do you know the force of the car? These questions are out of the use of the car. We're getting some mixed signals, Mr. Nolan. We have normal force. We have. Oh, we can do substitution. Okay, so you guys said you found the actual drag of a. Let's just use a drag of a torque because you guys are going to be given a list of known C's on your thing, okay? It's just fun to watch you guys scramble sometimes. Okay, so we'll say that since we're doing a Toyota Camry, it's going to be, you said 0 0.28? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so you guys tell me what this entire term is equal to then. 0.28. No, hon, this entire thing, this whole thing. Oh my God, no, solve for it. Solve for it. Oh, did I multiply wrong? 2.24. Oh my God. I typed into my calculator and I got three and I was like, that's wrong. I must have hit plus instead of times. What did you guys get? I got 
Oh, wait, I get the, um, I get the, wait, that's a 2.3 point. Yeah, that's a 2.3 point. Yeah, that's a 2.3 point. Hey, you know, I'll show that. Hold on, put it in the calculator, Josh. I got 366.9. Yeah, I got Okay. And after you deal with all of these units, it's going to come out to be newtons because it's the force of drag. Okay, so that's our force of drag. Now you guys need to find our force of friction. So you're going to do 0 0.02 times our mass, which is 1,500 times our... What's the other thing that comes into normal force? Okay, so let me know what our force of rolling friction is. 9294. 294? 294? Okay, so we have that the force of the car is equal to 294 newtons plus 366.9 newtons. So what's the force of the car equal to? Six hundred sixty point nine. Yeah. Six hundred what? Sixty. What are the units? Zero. Uh, All right. Okay. So, what are we trying to find? <laughs> After I sit, you guys on that like. Uh, downward spiral. Yeah, we're trying to find power, okay? So I need to erase some stuff to find room for power. Oh, God. It's just a force of time Yeah, but I gotta write it on the board. <laughs> you guys are so smart. Power <laughs> equals force times velocity. Okay, what's our force? 660.9. Okay, 669. What's our velocity? 30. Thank you for the meters per second. Okay, so what's our power? Uh, 19,827. What is it? 19,827 watts. Yeah. I don't know if it's Joshua. We're getting there. We're getting there. Hold on, but you're not going to multiply it by. Okay. So, is this the power of the car or the power of the engine? No, this is the power of the car. We use the force of the car to get this. This is the power of the car. But what are we? What, were we, what did we want to find? We wanted to find the power of the engine. We wanted to find the power of the engine. So, how much is lost? Okay, so the power of the car. 0 0.75 times the power of the engine. Oh, engine. 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 No. Pinch. I can't write. <laughs> Wait, no, never mind. Actually, I hate it. So how would we find the power of the engine? Divide by 47. Power of the car divided by 0 0.75 to get the power of the engine. Should this be bigger or smaller than the power of the car? It should be bigger because 25% was lost for the power of the car. So we want this total. What'd you get? 400. That's the answer. Yeah, you guys, whenever you have to do like um, these kinds of problems, they're going to give you the coefficient of drag in the problem. I didn't. I like to send you guys on like random little expeditions sometimes to look into things and why they are what they are and how they exist. But now you looked into what it stands for, and that's important. It's going to be in your history. Okay. So we've got one more example to do today, you guys. All right. That's okay. 
Okay. So this has to deal with stopping a brick, and there's going to be springs involved. So this one takes a little bit. It takes a little bit. Okay. So let's start with drawing a picture of sort of what the scenario is going to look. Okay. I just need to throw this away. I wonder if this one works. This one has a little bit left. Okay. So we've got a 25 centimeter spring standing vertically on the ground with its lower end secured in a base. So what that's going to look like is we've got this spring. And it's secured to the ground, okay? Now... We have a 1.5 kilogram brick and it is held 40 centimeters directly above the spring and dropped onto the spring. The spring compresses to a length of 17 centimeters before starting to launch the spring back upwards. We want to know what is the spring spring constant? All right. It's a big spring. Do we know the weight of the brick? Yeah, yeah it was 1.5 kilograms. <laughs> What's going to be the only thing acting on the brick when we drop it? Trust? Mm -hmm. No. Okay. So, we consider the top of the spring to be our zero position. And this brick is 40 centimeters above that. So it's at 0 0.4 meters above our zero position of this spring, okay? We said that we know the mass of the spring is 1.5 kilograms. What do you think its starting velocity is? Zero. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is sort of like our before. Okay, this is our before. So then we need to think about, okay, well, what's this going to look like once our, it hits our spring? Our velocity final is going to be when it Our velocity final is going to be when it's completely compressed right before it comes back up. That is zero. That is zero again. You, you guys just hold on. You'll look at the picture. First, we just need to draw the picture, and then we'll talk about it some more after the picture is drawn. Okay, when it is landing on the spring and it's about to pop back up, what are the two forces acting on it? Gravity and spring, normal force and gravity. Gravity and the spring force. Yeah. Yeah, that. Okay. So remember that right here was our zero, and we're told that the spring compresses to a length of 17 centimeters. Hmm. So how are we going to want to label the rest of this? Um, we know the original length is going to be like 0 0.08 to 11 zero meters. The original length of the spring was 25 centimeters. So like this original length of the spring right here. Why don't you just make it from the bottom of the floor to zero? I mean, you could, but I'm not doing that for this problem. So that means distance is going to be negative. Yeah, because whenever we talked about springs getting compressed or stretched, haven't we said that whenever a spring's compressed, it's always considered negative, a negative displacement? Okay. Mm -hmm. The negative 0.8. Yes. Well, is it just 0.8 or is it something? 0.08 meters. Okay. So our change in displacement of the spring, since you guys pointed out some of this, negative 0 0.08 meters okay and you said that right before it pops back up its final speed is going to be zero meters per second because it's at a turning point now how far did the brick fall 0.48 yes the delta y of the brick 0 0.48 meters. Okay. I think that should be everything we need. 
and we are trying to find our spin constant. This is a lot of information. This is a very loaded problem. So strap in, it's gonna be fun. Okay, so we can do this in one step. Notice the uh, finger quotes, okay? Hmm? Yeah, notice the finger quotes though, okay? So we know that the change in the energy of the system is the change in kinetic energy, which is the total work, which is going to be the work of gravity plus the work of the spring. Because obviously when we're up here and before we dropped and hit this, we, we can't figure out what the spring constant is because we have nothing to compare it to yet. No compression, no nothing. So we're going to be focused over here in this situation where we have gravity and the spring both doing work. Okay. Now, our change in kinetic energy. Do we have a change in kinetic energy? Yeah. From the beginning to the end? No. No. Why don't we? Because the velocity is the same as zero. Yeah. Our initial velocity is zero. Our final velocity is zero. So that means that our change in kinetic energy is going to be zero. Okay. Now, if our change in kinetic energy is zero, what is our total work done? Zero. Okay. So, do you think gravity here is considered to be doing work in the positive direction or the negative direction? Positive because it's going in the direction that our middle. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Ian. You remembered. It's positive because gravity is doing work in the direction of the motion, okay? Remember that positive work is always in the direction of the motion. And since the brick was coming down, that means that gravity was doing positive work on it, which means what is the spring force? Negative. It's gonna be negative work. I'm so proud of you, you guys are doing great. Okay, so. Let's look at these two works. Let's start with the work done due to gravity. Okay, <laughs> so the work due to gravity is going to be the force due to gravity times the change in displacement of our brick. Because we're looking for the work done on the brick right now, okay? We're gonna look for this work done by the brick. So, how do we find the force of gravity? Just uh, mass times gravity. Time. Yeah, mass, mass times gravity. Negative mass times gravity, right? And then our displacement due to the brick is also negative, which means those two negatives are going to make gravity into what? Positive. Positive, which is awesome because we said it should be positive. So, when we plug this in, it's going to be... Our mass is 1.5 kilograms times our negative 9.8 meters per second squared times our displacement of the brick, which is negative 0 0.48 meters. Huh? What about the equation for potential energy? No. Well, MGH is, yeah, but we're doing force times displacement, which is considered work. But remember, you guys, work is technically the negative change in potential, like we talked about earlier. This is giving us work, Donald. We're getting work. We still have to look at the, the um, work due to the spring is technically going to be equal and opposite. Yes, because it equals out to zero, but we're still going to solve for it, <laughs> okay? So can somebody please tell me what this is? 7.056? And what are the units? Joules. Joules, okay. So that's our work due to gravity. Now, as Donald so kindly pointed out, 
since our total work is equal to zero, the work of our spring is going to be equal and opposite, right? Okay. So if you are trying to look for that, though, like let's say, for instance, maybe it's not zero, you would need to remember that work can be equal to the negative change of potential. Like we talked about, I think like two days ago, maybe three days ago. Well, you we weren't here three days ago. Okay. Which means that we would have to deal with that potential energy of the spring that I showed you guys. Initially, before everything starts, the spring's at the zero position, which means that here the change in potential would just be negative one half kx final squared. And we know that that's going to be equal to negative 7.06 joules because, well, it's equal and opposite because work is equal to zero. Okay? So with that information, can we, oh, I've just put six, five, six. Do you think we can solve for our K? Our spring constant? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, solve for it. Mm 